Amen. Ladies, thank you for leading us so beautifully. And that's why we're here today, to shout to the Lord, all the earth. And I hope you've come with hearts prepared for worship today. 230 years. That's a long time as a church. And we're glad to be celebrating that today and celebrating the great things that God has done and the great things that he's going to continue to do. Thank you for joining us for worship. If you're a guest, especially a first-time guest, inside your bulletin there, you will find what we call a Connect form, and it asks for a little information if you are a guest. We would be so honored if you would just fill that out and drop it in the offering plate as it is passed or hand it to one of us afterwards. We'd love to meet you, but we'd love to know a little bit about you. But we're grateful you're here. We're grateful all of you are here. And our prayer for you today is that you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place Amen. as we worship him. Why don't you stand and greet those around you with a smile and a handshake and let them know that you love them. This thing, this thing drives me crazy. <laughs> it's not the... And there is power, there is power in the name of Jesus. You join as we lift our voices in praise together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Now you join as we continue a beautiful statement of faith. We believe, we believe. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation we 
Christ in his righteousness alone. All blessed to stand before the throne. Good morning. Let us pray. Our most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we give you praise for your faithfulness for the past 230 years. And Heavenly Father, we also give you praise and thanks that you led Brother Todd here 20 years ago and the faithful service that he has provided to this church and this community, and we, we love him and we thank you for that. And Heavenly Father, we pray, pray that you continue to bless him and his family that he would have many more years of service to our congregation, our church, and this community. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be with, with Dr. Smith as he brings the message this morning. Speak through him, and if there's someone here that does not know you as their personal Savior, may today be the day that you, he, they make that decision. And Heavenly Father, as we come to the time of service to receive your tithes and offerings, we pray that you would bless it and use it to further your kingdom. These things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Lori, and reminding us, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. And you know, his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You stand and join as we sing together. What a great day this is. You can feel the Holy Spirit in this place today, and I am so thankful for His presence, 
so thankful for your presence here on this special day. 230 years, not many churches can say that they've been ministering for 230 years. Can't tell you how honored um, that I am and, and Kelly, our family, to uh, serve as your 50th pastor. I, I count it uh, a real honor and joy that uh, you have put up with me for 20 years and uh, that my wife has put up with me for almost 17 years and that God has blessed this church. People have asked through the years what has been the secret of how we've grown from the little church to to where we are today and and the greatest thing I can say is the power of prayer a lot of prayer you know when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 we have tried to model ourselves after the New Testament church Acts 242 they devoted themselves to the Apostles teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer and we have tried to stick close to that model and as a result God is, has brought and continues to bring blessings upon blessings so today is a day to celebrate God's faithfulness and how he's blessed us through the years his hand has been upon us and I pray for his continued hand to guide us and direct us but we always have a time of prayer in our service because we're celebrating but some of you are finding it hard to celebrate why your heart is heavy your heart is broken your spirit is is down and you're having marital struggles and you've got a rebellious child maybe you're battling depression and you're finding it hard to smile or sing Maybe you're battling a private addiction that no one else knows about, but the Lord knows, and God is able. He's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, and he wants to bring peace in the midst of the storm. Jesus stood on the boat, and he said, when the disciples said, Lord, Master, don't you care if we drown? Jesus stood and said, Peace, be still, and the winds and waves subsided. And he said, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? That's why we pray. We have faith in the Lord to do what we cannot do on our own strength. And today, if you feel led by the Holy Spirit to come kneel at this altar or place an arm of encouragement around someone or to pray on behalf of someone, I'm gonna invite you to join me at this altar as we lift up our prayers to the only one that can meet our every need. Won't you come pray with me today?
It is my great honor and privilege today to introduce to you our special guest. So grateful today that Dr. Robert Smith and his wife Wanda are here to lead us in worship. And would you all just stand at this time and let us show our thanks for you, not all of you, but the Smiths, we want you to stand. <laughs> Will you all stand so we can just thank you all for being here today. And you taught me how to communicate. <laughs> he was a much better teacher than I was student, that's for sure. Dr. Smith is professor of Christian preaching at Beeson Divinity School at Sanford in Birmingham. Uh, Dr. Smith holds the Charles T. Carter Baptist Chair of Divinity and previously served as the Carly Bates Associate Professor of Christian Preaching at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. And it was there in 1994 that I had the privilege of having Dr. Smith as my preaching professor, uh, preaching practicum. This is where you preach three sermons throughout the course of the semester with the camera on you and all of your uh, fellow students and peers critiquing and, and watching you talk about nerve-wracking having Dr. Smith and your fellow classmates uh, but it was never that way with Dr. Smith um, I have a VCR tape Dr. Smith that has those three sermons that I preached and mainly throughout the course of those sermons you hear Dr. Smith's voice in the background encouraging this young man as he was preaching God's word. And I treasure those times. Not only was he a mentor who taught me so much in the classroom, but a mentor in life who has taught me how to be a, a man after God's own heart outside of the classroom. So Dr. Smith, what a joy it is. He's a sought after speaker. He's preached all over the world. He's written books, some of which are available out in the foyer after the service. Um, he just got back from Israel uh, just this past week. Um, we are humbled and honored that you're here to speak today. As of last Thursday, I thought I was going to be your homecoming speaker. Bill took me to lunch and he said, I've got something I need to tell you. And I, I had no idea what it was. He said, you're not going to be preaching on homecoming. And I said, oh, okay. He said, Dr. Smith is coming to preach. Man, if, if you could have seen my facial expression, I'm so grateful that Bill and David Nance, our church historian, worked to get Dr. Smith here. In my previous two churches where I served as youth minister, Dr. Smith came to preach for us and blessed our hearts. Throughout the course of these last 20 years, on several occasions, we've tried to schedule Dr. Smith. Schedules conflicted and he was unable to come, but it was God's timing that this would be a time for such as this. So in a few moments, would you make Dr. Smith feel welcome as he comes to preach for us? We hear you prayerfully as God speaks through you. Thank you for being here.
Let us pray. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God be praised. What a delicious privilege it is to fellowship with the forks of the Elkhorn Baptist Church. I'm grateful for the invitation. I'm grateful for God's providential timing. His clocks always keep perfect timing. I'm not here out of an incident or an accident or a coincidence. I'm here because of providence. And I'm grateful to meet you. I knew that when I would come here that uh, I would be meeting people that I'm going to be spending eternity with. And since that's the case, it was about time for us to get to know each other. <laughs> when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. I'm grateful for the presence of my wife, Dr. Wanda Taylor Smith, who's sitting on the end next to another beautiful lady. And they are not hard on the optic nerves. <laughs> Amen. And my sister on the end adds to it. So three beautiful ladies sitting on one pew. And uh, the Lord, in fact, is just crowning us with his presence. You look like the kingdom of God. This is how the kingdom of God is going to look. Black, white, brown, yellow, and red. People from every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. That's the text. That's the revelation, that's John in Revelation 5, 9, and Revelation 7, 9. I'm grateful for that. This is a foretaste of glory divine. To my son in the ministry, my mentee, my brother, uh, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. I have to say, that I want excellence from those people that God has blessed me to serve. Not because of me, but for his glory. And I said to the 8 o'clock, 8.30 crowd, that there are three things that I hope will be concretized and uh, made visible in uh, those that I participate in ministry with. One, fidelity. Faithfulness in preaching scripture. No shifting, no compromising, no reducing. You have a pastor who has served you for 20 years. An appetizer, a five course meal, and a dessert. No happy meals, no Sermonic snacks. When you come here, you know to bring your best china, your best flatware, your best stemware, because Pastor Lester is going to give you not only enough for the service, but something that you can carry home with you. That's a compliment. You may not know that, but I came to remind you, God has blessed you to have an individual who is a chef who knows what you need because what you need, he understands, doesn't come from philosophy, doesn't come from the news, comes from scripture. So I'm grateful for his fidelity. Second of all, his integrity. You have a pastor that you can be very proud of. He is not a statistic. He is not a dropout. He is not someone that your head needs to bow down when his name is mentioned. Uh, he is a credit to the kingdom and a credit to the church. And for that reason, I'm grateful uh, that you epitomize what I think every student ought to be uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then last of all, longevity. Not 20 months, but 20 years. 
with one group of people. And to hear him talk, it's as if this is his investiture service, his installation. He just got here. He's been taking us around, telling us the story like a little boy in a candy store. His passion has not subsided. He is not bored. It's a wonderful thing. He got an A in my class. That was before Kelly. <laughs> when he married Kelly, he got an A plus. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, it's just a real joy. I don't take it for granted that you have been a person of fidelity, integrity, and longevity. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, he talks about Demas. He said, Demas has deserted me having loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica, you have not deserted your Lord, and thereby you have not deserted me. And I'm proud of you. I'm glad to be alive, to see you not survive, but to thrive and to flourish, to look at your beautiful wife and your family, and to know the kind of preaching that you continue to do. I follow you at times and hear about you and it's always a word of commendation. God bless you Pastor Lester and thank you for letting me come and letting my wife come and letting us share with you guys on this very auspicious occasion. I want to talk about the God of our help and our hope. The God of our help and our hope. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the poets, the multi-talented servant, picked up his pen of illumination and dipped it in the ink of inspiration and penned these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, or even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This psalm, perhaps the best known psalm and maybe the least understood psalm, is a psalm that is pregnant with Trinitarian presence. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is evident. Because the psalm begins with the Father, Yahweh. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. It ends with the Father, Yahweh. Verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh, the Lord, forever. So the Father is evident. The Son is anticipated. In fact, Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, points out that there will be a time in which his words will be fulfilled. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. And this happened, of course, when Jesus is arrested that evening in the garden of Gethsemane, and all the disciples fled from him. Jesus will say in John 10 and 11, I am the good shepherd. And whoever wrote Hebrews, Hebrews 13 and 20 will say that he is the great shepherd. And Peter will say in 2 Peter 5 and 4, he is the good shepherd. So the son is anticipated. The Holy Spirit is necessitated. And though his name, 
does not perceive any explicit presence. He is there empowering us to trust him. Because I want to contend, I want to posit today that the Holy Spirit, who is sent by the Son, enables believers to trust the Father to the end of their days. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I don't want to repeat everything I said this morning. It took me a long time to say that. And uh, if you're interested, get the tape for the 830 service. And let me move on. The Lord is the isness of the Lord, not the Lord heretofore, and not the Lord hereafter, but the Lord here and now. That's what we struggle with. We are good at talking about the God of the heretofore before, what he has done, and the God, as we projected, of the hereafter. But what we need to concentrate on is the God of the here and now. You quoted it in your prayer, Hebrews 13 and 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. And we're good at talking about what he did yesterday and what he will do in the future. But what is he doing in your life now? So much so that you can project the future and you can have a retrospective journey in the past. But don't tell me what he did for you in Mississippi, in Tennessee, in Arkansas. That's all right. Don't tell me what you believe he'll do in the future. I want to know that you know that he woke you up this morning and started you on your way. I want to know that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask to think right now. The Lord is my shepherd. Not our shepherd. I know he's our shepherd, but you've got to get to the place, Robert Smith, where you're talking about your individual relationship with him. My shepherd, sanctified selfishness, testifying what he is to you. Not he's my shepherd by ownership because nobody owns him, but he's my shepherd by relationship. He's my shepherd. It's not just that the Lord is my shepherd, but the shepherd is my Lord. He calls the shots. I want him to be my shepherd because he provides. But he is not only my shepherd, but the shepherd is my Lord because he directs, which means he orders not only my steps, but he also orders my stops. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, in shady green pastures so rich and so sweet. God leaves his dear children alone where the cool waters flow, bathe the weary one's feet. God leads his dear children along, some through the waters, some through the blood, through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood, some through great trials, but God gives a song in the night season. Mm. And all the day long, he makes me even when I don't want to do it. He makes me come to a place of a halt. He makes me lie down, not in brown grass, but in green pastures. He, 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 third person singular. He, the Lord, is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. Still waters are not stagnant waters. Sheep cannot drink rapidly flowing water because if they lean over and the water is flowing down or the rapids quickly and they try to sip it, it's possible that they'll fall into the riverbed and their coat uh, will be soaked and saturated with a sense of heaviness and they'll not be able, they will not be able to get out of that riverbed and will drown to death. But the good shepherd who knows that his sheep are not drinkers but uh, sippers will take large boulders and dam up a section so they can have their own private area and they can lean down so that the rapidly flowing waters are going around the dam and now there's still waters inside of it and they just, mm, just sip up waters. 
Do you understand what God does for us? He takes and dams up areas. Life is busy. Life is incessantly active. And he'll dam up life for you so you can sip what you can't drink and cause a peace of tranquility to be in your life when outside of you there is a kind of turbulence. It's what you said. He gives you peace, not in the absence of a storm, but peace in the midst of the storm. So that he, it's not only what he provides, but it's for, it's for what he prevents. Do you know what he prevents in your life? Every now and then he'll give you a retrospective view and you'll look back and see all the stuff he's damned up. Mm. So it didn't drown you and allowed you to sip so that you not only survive, but you're able to thrive. He takes and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. In the Hebrew, what that really means, particularly as the shepherd ministers to a sheep, is that when sheep who are heavy in body weight, and it looks like God has made a kind of zoological mistake, big body for sheep, all that wool, and these toothpick legs to support that body. And every now and then they'll fall over, lose their equilibrium, and they can't get up. And the gas will build up. And they die of asphyxiation. They die, they die of strangulation. And the shepherd has to pick up the sheep and set it up on his feet in order for it to continue to exist. He restores my soul. He puts life back into me. David understood this personally. He lost his equilibrium. He was successful when he fought the giants. Goliath, he won. But another giant slayed David. A giant called adultery. Bathsheba. He fell off of his feet. He could not pull himself back up. But the Lord restored his soul. So much so that he is renewed. He is reinvigorated. He is revived. I wonder if there's anybody here who's ever lost their equilibrium, fell off of their feet. It could have been because of a relational rift and you couldn't pick yourself back up. It could be because there was a financial reversal. It could be that you received a diagnosis that absolutely caused your world to fall apart. Cancer. Or something else and the Lord comes to you where you are in the midst of your despondency your melancholy and sets you up back up on your feet so that now that you've gone through the test you got a testimony and you can tell people that God is able to bring you out don't lie there ask the Savior to help you comfort strengthen and keep you he is willing to aid you he will carry you through. I wish I had the time to take a panoramic survey of all the people in the Bible and just tell you how God continued to put them back up on their feet. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty together again. But I know a king who can. His name is King Jesus. And if you've lost your balance, if you lost your footing, if you made a mistake, and I'm looking at everyone in this group, and all of us have made mistakes and have sinned. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his or her own way. But the Lord has laid on him, Isaiah 53, 5, 6, etc., the iniquity of us all. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Every shepherd who was a good shepherd, an effective shepherd, a caring shepherd, knew that dotted across the hillsides of that area were various paths that led to various places, sometimes to various perilous places, and other times to provisions. 
And a shepherd had to know where each path led. In fact, the Hebrew is, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. That is, he leads me in the wagon tracks of truth. Where uh, trails had been worn into the hillsides. Proven trails. And the shepherd needed to know where these trails would lead. Because there were predators along the way. And even there were robbers that would hijack the caravans carrying precious cargo. Had to be familiar with the wagon tracks. And what the Lord does is, through his spirit, as I said to the, the crowd this morning, the spirit leads us in all truth, John 16, 13. He knows the trails. There is a way that seems right unto us, but the end of is the way of death. And I'm afraid that we've entered an era in our world uh, of uh, Judges 2, 10, and 11, and another generation arose that did not know the Lord nor what they, he had done for his people. And as Judges ends in chapter 21, verse 25, uh, and there was no king in Israel, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. Situational ethics. If it feels good to you, if you want to do it, just do it. And the word of God, those of us who are shepherds and all of us are shepherds to someone, ought to point out that's not the right road. It might be popular. It might be appealing. It might be appetizing, but that's not the right road. The right road is a personified road. Jesus says in John 14 and 6, I am not a way, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No such thing as a, a plurality of ways, pluralism. Well, you can go to God, uh, according to Dr. Ophel Renfrew and Dr. Phil, uh, by this or that, you better listen to Dr. Jesus. He says, I am the way. He leads me in the paths of righteousness mm, for his name's sake. Mm. Mm. because a shepherd's reputation was always on the line when it came to uh, the sheep. A shepherd that left with a hundred sheep and brought back a hundred had a, a reputation that was exalted and commendable. That's why Jesus tells the parable of the ninety-nine and one sheep. He had a hundred and one got lost. Now, I've read that for years, and I always had the 99 in the barn. Uh, I had the 99 uh, with fences around them out in the wilderness, protected. But the Bible says, when you read Matthew 15, that the 99 were in the mountains, in the wilderness, unprotected. He left 99 sheep, an economic liability, to go after one sheep, just one. He could have lost many other sheep, trying to find just the one. And the one could have been dead when he found the sheep. It just goes to show you how much he loves us. And don't let artists give you a misconstrual of this. The Bible never said anything about a lamb. Every time I look at it, uh, here's this artist's conception of this shepherd carrying a lamb on the shoulder that might weigh 40 pounds. He found a sheep, 100 pounds or more, carrying it on the shoulder. Because the sheep is immobilized, the sheep has been injured, he's carrying it across gullies, across the ravines, etc. He loved you so much that he picked you up and carried you when you could not carry yourself. Here's this text saying, he does it for the namesake of the good shepherd. His reputation is on the line. Uh, that's why Jesus will say in John 10, 28, Father, what you've given me, no one has been able to snatch you, snatch them out of my hand. Mm. No one has been able. The devil can't snatch us out of the hand of Christ. We will persevere. We are saved. We cannot have salvation abrogated. We can't have it canceled or known. We are saved. You're not trying to get to heaven. You're already experiencing heaven right now. Therefore, the psalmist says he does it for the name's sake. Oh, now, I, verse 1, 2, and 3, I like that. I love it. But I can't live in 
green pastures. I can't stay by the still waters incessantly. I've got to know what it's like to leave verse 3 to go to verse 4. Uh, notice now in verse 4, the temperature changes. Notice it's no longer bright and light. Uh, there's shadows there. Uh, notice there are prowlers there because we go from the green pastures to the valley. And how did we get to the valley? What happened? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel the evil because you're with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. How did we get there? We got there because the same one who led us in green pastures, led us by the still water and restored our soul, led us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, is the same one who leads us in the valley. And that's just normal for the Christian. Do you remember the time when Jesus experienced the blessedness and the placidness of being baptized in Jordan's River? There's Trinitarian presence there. The second person of the Trinity is being baptized in the Jordan River. And the spirit in the form of a dove set on his shoulder, third person. And God is broadcasting from heaven his divine approbation. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Oh, I love it. That's Matthew 3, 17. The very next verse, and you remember the Bible was not originally written in chapters and verses, but the very next verse is Matthew 4 and 1. Then Jesus mm, was thrust out into the wilderness by the Spirit, the one who sat on the shoulder like a dove. Yes, thrust him out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil you cannot live brother robert smith by green pastures all the time you've got to experience the valley it's a rhythm of reversal it's what joshua abraham heschel the great old testament rabbi calls the order of ascendancy he says that life for the believer is a life lived, first of all, in silence, and then sighing, and then singing, singing, like that. Silence, sighing, singing. Everybody wants to get to that. But I want Joshua Abraham Heschel to know that life is also a order of descendancy, that you can go from singing, the sign, the silence, just like that, without any notice at all. And I've got to learn to live with laughter and lamentation, with feasting and fasting, with singing and with silence. They are there. And the text says in verse 4, even though I walk through the valley, even though, in spite of, regardless of, I've got to have some even though religion. I know how to say religion. I won't say it the way my ancestors said it. Religion. I've got to have some even though religion. It's the kind of religion that Job was talking about in Job 13, 15. He says, even though he slay me, Yet will I trust him, is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego meant. In Daniel 3.18, when Nebuchadnezzar said to them, maybe you didn't understand the mandate that whenever the Babylonian symphony orchestra plays, you're supposed to bow down before my golden image. They said, we understood it. We'd rather burn than bow. And he said, let me give you this report. We don't want you to think that God is impotent. Our God is able to deliver us from the fire of furnace. But if not, we still won't bow. And hear the words of Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Even though there are no crops in the field, even though there are no grapes on the vine, even though there are no figs on the tree, even though there are no cattle in the stall, yet will I rejoice in God my Savior. So when life breaks down 
and God has not broken through. You just got finished it, singing it. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil on Christ. You've got to stand even when life shifts on you because God will never leave you alone and he wants to see, can you trust him when you're in the boat with him and the waters have filled up the boat and the boat is sinking, will you say to him, uh, Master, we are suing you for non-support. Master, don't you care that we perish? Don't have him get up and have to ask you, do you still have faith? Stop complaining that he's sleeping in the boat and thank God he's in the boats. Because if he's in the boats, nature itself will have to hear him say, peace, and the winds go back to the four corners of the earth. Be still and the waves lay down like gentle lands. Even though I walk, I walk, I walk. Christianity ultimately is not a flight. It's not a run. It is a walk. Oh, I want to fly, and every now and then I get a chance to fly through the valley. Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Every now and then you get a chance to fly. Won't last long. Every now and then you get a chance to run. They shall run and not be weary. I can run more than I can fly, but I don't really get a chance to run much. They shall walk and not faint because Christianity is a walk. And sometimes it's a baby walk. You make little progress as far as you're concerned, but God wants you to know that ultimately it's a walk. It's not a 100-yard dash. It's not a 777 flight. It's a walk, and he walks with us. Yea, though I walk through, 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 that's not in the valley, but through the valley. I got to pay attention to that word, through. I hear Isaiah saying to us in Isaiah 43, verse 2, after the Lord has said, I am your redeemer. I have summoned you by my name. When you pass, through the waters, I'll be with you, through. When you walk through the rivers, they will not drown you. When you pass through the fire, it will not burn you, through. Mm. Sometimes you can get stuck in the valley. The valley was never meant to be a residence for us. It was meant to be a thoroughfare to come through it. Uh, that date, September the 15th, 1963, Birmingham, Alabama, 16th Street Baptist Church. 10.22 a.m., a bomb went off as the church was transferring and transitioning from Sunday school in preparation to the morning service. And four little girls in the aftermath of that bomb died. And if you go there today in the basement in their area of the museum, their clock is there. And the hands are frozen. It says 1022. Stop 1022. I know what that's like. When we got that call on October the 30th, 2010, that our son had been murdered while working at his restaurants. Life became a place of stuckness for us. Mm. And yet God says, no, I'm going to take you through. And now it's been almost eight years for us, and people will ask me every now and then, uh, have you come to closure on the loss of your son? I say, closure is for bank accounts. It's not for love accounts. God has to keep taking you through, massaging your heart, keep nurturing and nursing you. Some of us have gotten stuck. We're not walking through, we're in the valley. Time has frozen up on us. Somebody in our family has broken our heart. Someone has betrayed our trust. Something has happened so that life is a place of 
stuck everything. Don't look in the dictionary. I just made that up. Sound pretty good to me. God wants to take you through the valley. The valley is a wonderful place because what it indicates is that when the shepherd leads the sheep from the brightness uh, and that sunlit area of the, of the um, uh, green pastures and has come to the valley, uh, the shepherd knows that uh, he must be vigilant because they're predators, they're hyenas and wild lions and, and, and other predators that are there. Uh, and so he walks with the sheep. And brothers and sisters, uh, when it comes to the valley, it's an indication that you can never have a valley without mountains on either side. You're not far from the mountain. You can't have a valley without the verticality of mountain sides on both sides. And what makes the valley so wonderful is Jesus is in the valley. Didn't you hear someone say he's the lily of the valley? He gets in the valley with you. Not only do we walk through the valley, but we also walk through the shadows. Mm. It's not as light as it was by the green pastures and beside still waters. But the fact that the shepherd knows the way, even in the darkness. And that's what Gardner Taylor, the great African-American preacher, was talking about years ago when he was preaching in his native red stick, Baton uh, Rouge, Louisiana, and he was preaching as this young preacher, and all of a sudden, there was an electrical failure, and the lights went out, and it stunned him as a young preacher, and he didn't know what to say for a moment, and some man from the back, some elder said, preach, preacher, we can still see Jesus in the dark. You've got to be able to see Jesus in the dark. The test of your Christianity is not just seeing him when you're being blessed and promotions are coming and your health is going well and your family is all together. But what do you do when it gets dark? Can you see Jesus in the dark, in the shadows? It's a blessing to know that when you're in the shadows, you're overshadowed by the shadow. Psalm 91 and 1. So he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. And James Russell Law looked at it well and he said, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but the scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown stands God in the shadow, keeping watch of brothers up. I want you to know that God is so vigilant that he knows everything that you do. He's so acquainted with you that every strand of hair is numbered. And you see that he is counting my uh, reduced hairs fall from my head. The Bible even says in Psalm 56 and 8 that he takes our tears and puts them in a bottle that he might remember how many gallons, how many pints, how many quarts of tears you shed because tears represent liquid love and tears represent a language that God understands. So why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? If Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. If you sing that long enough, you stop asking questions and you turn your question mark into an exclamation point. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Yes, I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil mm -mm, because you are with me. Your rod. Your staff, they comfort me. There's a move now from the third person singular. He the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for the name, his name's sake. Third person singular. That's for situations where there is uh, water that he's leading you beside. 
where there is restoring of your soul, that's that kind of language is all right, because that's, that language talks about God. But once you get in the valley, you move from third person singular to second person singular. You are with me, verse 4. Your rod, your staff, comfort me. A lot of folk are good with third person singular. Talk about God. Tell me about God. That's wonderful. But when the night starts closing in on you and there are questions that you can't answer and it looks like God has moved to New York City and there's not left a forwarding address and you can't find it and he acts like he's playing hide and go seek and you feel like Job in Job 23. Oh, I wish I could find God. I go up north, I go down south, I go east to west, but I can't find him. you got to stop talking about God and start talking to God because of your relationship with him. Your rod. Mm. Uh, this shepherd is packing. He has a rod, which is an extended portion of one piece of wood that might have in it metal and bone to fight the predator that would attack the sheep. Because David understood what that meant. He said one time when he was facing Goliath, you coming to me, but you don't understand. I'm not just a little boy. I've had experience. When a bear came to attack my father's sheep, I killed the bear. When a lion came to attack my father's sheep, I killed the lion. And God will give me power to destroy you, you uncircumcised Philistine. That rod is there. And that shepherd is really saying to the hyenas and the mountain lion, you want some of this? Come on, come on, I've got it, come on, come on. I'm packing. I'm not empty-handed. And God is there to protect you. Your rod, your staff, that crook-like piece of wood that he uses oftentimes to lean on and to pull the young lamb out of the gullies. They bring me comfort to know that God is packing and God is there to protect me. Now let me quickly hurry on. Thank you for a little, little grace in terms of time. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me. Not in the absence, but in the presence of my enemies. Good shepherds would take and go to what was known as the tableland and pull up poisonous weeds and plants and herbs and then bring the sheep so that the sheep could bed down for the night and graze in grass that was not polluted with potentially harmful plants. Mm. He prepares a table before me. Mm. Or sometimes he would go ahead of the sheep to make sure that the mountain lions, the hyenas, etc., would be cleared away and leave uh, the under-shepherds with the flock, never unattended. Now, there are two prepositions here, preposition of time and a preposition of location. You prepare a table before me, preposition of time. You prepare a table before me, preposition of location. Preposition of time. You prepare a table before me where I can graze before I get there. Time. I don't even see it. You go ahead of me to do that. We just got back from Israel. There was a place where we received great hospitality uh, by a man who was uh, uh, Abram. Uh, in that country, of course, uh, hospitality uh, was uh, uh, the, the most important thing that one could do for a visitor. And do you not know that it was not long that we were sitting uh, on chairs? Some of them sat down and crossed their legs. We had chicken, all kinds of desserts. We had that good lemonade, all that. They didn't just cook that. They cooked that before we got there. And God will prepare a table before you get there. You have no idea what God is doing. You want to drop out and give up? Do you know what God is doing before you get there? And when you get there, and you see that God has already fixed things because we take and worry about stuff. And we worry that we're not worried. And worry is the interest that we pay on trouble before it falls due. And sometimes it never falls due. He takes and prepares a table before us before we get there. That's the language of Mary Magdalene and the other women as they approach the tomb of Jesus 
after the Sabbath is over? Their big question is, who's going to roll back the stone? And when they get there, the stone has already been rolled back by the angel. And some of us are facing some important questions and some things in our lives, and we're wondering who trust him to go before you mm. and to prepare the table. But there's also a preposition of location. And sometimes the shepherd would be pulling out poisonous plants while the sheep would be grazing and there are mountain lions and hyenas around and he is feeding them in the presence of the enemy because he's packing. Come on, you want some of this? Come on, I dare you to touch one of my sheep. And what God will do is in 1 Samuel chapter 24, he'll let David go into a cave in En Gedi, the interior part, and stay there, and here comes Saul, who's trying to kill him. And Saul will go there to relieve himself and not even know that David is in the interior. And God will bless David in the presence of his enemy. Stop trying to get back at folk. Folk cuss you out. Folk try to do you in. Folk try to pull out the carpet. No, let him prepare the table. Stop trying to uh, get back at what they're doing. He prepares a table before me. Come on, Robert, get finished. In the presence of my enemies, he anoints my head with oil. Mm, my head. Those sheep who have been uh, bitten by pests and incense, it's so irritating, even to the point that you can see uh, blood oozing a little bit out of their face and noses and so forth. And that shepherd will take hot oil and pour it down the face of the sheep and rub it in with a kind of tar-like substance to give the sheep relief. What our shepherd does is to anoint us with oil because our greatest struggle is not with the mountain lion and the hyena, but with the insect that just irritates you, mm, just keeps biting on you, you know, just irritated. Some folk are like that. They're not lions, they just irritate you. Just keep on biting you. Just keep on making you uncomfortable. And he has a way of massaging you, pouring the oil, which represents the spirit, in the presence of your enemies. And then he anoints your head with all your cup. You can't contain it. Now let me finish. Verse 6. Surely, undoubtedly, unquestionably, Goodness and mercy, that word for goodness is the Hebrew word hesed, which is the word for grace. God's unconditional love, goodness and mercy. Because grace is what you receive from God that you don't deserve. And mercy is what you receive from God and you do deserve it. You deserve punishment, but you get mercy. And you don't deserve his grace, but you get it in spite of it. You don't qualify for it. It's, and I used to preach this. It's amazing. I don't know about you, brother pastor, but I can't go back to some of the sermons that I preached. Uh, I don't know why the Lord let me. I was, I was sincere, but I was just sincerely wrong. I just didn't have it. I just didn't, just didn't have it. I always had goodness and mercy by the side of the sheep. Surely goodness on one side and mercy on the other side. But then the text says, shall follow me. Ah! So, goodness and mercy follows mm, because sheep are nibblers. They keep their head down and they'll walk off the path. And these sheep dogs, goodness and mercy, keep biting at the feet of the sheep. When the sheep goes out too far to get the sheep back on the, the straight and narrow way. And some of us think that God just keeps interfering in our lives nipping at our heels. You know why? Because he knows all of us like sheep have gone astray. He knows all of us are interested in our own plans. And he has to send some things that are uncomfortable to get us back in the path that he's designed for us. Goodness and mercy following after us. I believe that one of these days when we stand before God, and we know that we deserve eternal damnation and separation from God. Because we know that behind us, there is thrown in our pathway 
wickedness, iniquity, mistakes, sin, you name it, it's there. And God will say, not guilty, blameless, sinless, faultless. People say, how? How can it be with all that stuff behind me? And when we look behind, we don't see anything. And we want to know what happened to all the wickedness? What happened to all of the sin? What happened to all of, of the faults, the blame, the sin? So did not tell you that goodness and mercy would follow after you, picking up after you, cleaning up after you, sweeping away all of that. So that when we stand before God, we're dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell permanently in the house of the Lord forever. The same David the psalmist pins these words in Psalm 27 and 5. He says in verse 4 that one thing had he desired of the Lord and that he had followed after that he might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire at his temple. The shepherd comes to our house in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in my house, in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters of my house. He restores my soul in my house. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake in my house. But in verse 6, I go to his house. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in his house, in the house of the Lord forever. Thank God for the shepherd. The shepherd is a lamb. For every single year, during the year, uh, the day of Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement, Mercy had been integrated by justice. Said, I want to be paid off. I've been receiving installment payments, payments all these years. One lamb offered on the Passover. That would take and cancel out the sins, not only of the priests, the high priests, but also those of the individuals who had presented an offering to God. I want to be paid in full. And I hear the psalmist saying in Psalm 85 and 10, mercy and truth met together. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. And mercy was asked about truth, when are you going to pay me in full? And mercy said, well, there is one who's coming who's going to pay you in full one of these days. And I hear John saying in John 1, 29, there he is, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. There he is. And don't you know that one Friday on dead man's hill at crucifixion sites, this lamb dies. And he dies to the point that the Bible says that the veil in the temple was rent, was torn from top to bottom. And when that happened, what God was doing was tearing up the mortgage notes. And a songwriter said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. And I'm glad today that the shepherd is also my Lord. And he is not only my help, but he is also my hope. And one of these days when life is over, you think that we're having a good time down here. But when my soul stands before the Lord, and when I run out the ring of trouble in my garments, and I bow down to give him praise, then I stand before my Lord, and I bow down before my God, and I'll say, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of
of all. He is my help. He is my hope. He is my shepherd who leads me not only by still waters but through the valley so that one day he will lead me to his home where when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. Thank you for your watch. It didn't really help me today. We've no less days to sing God praise than when we first begun. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And, and if you're here today and you've never met Jesus, who was the shepherd, who is the lamb, the lamb of God, what a perfect time to come to know him personally. He'll change your life for eternity. Won't you come meet him? He's been waiting for you. And his timing is perfect. Why not come now? Amen. Would you be seated just for a moment? Thank you so much for being here today. Can't thank Dr. Smith enough for being here today. Thank you for blessing my life all those years ago, and you're continuing to bless lives, our lives here today. Thank you, and Mrs. Smith, for being here today and allowing God to use you in a mighty way. We are honored and we are blessed. And uh, I know that we're going to leave here better than before we came in. So thank you so much for being here today. Bill, thank you and David and David Nance for, for tricking me and fooling me <laughs> and for getting Dr. Smith here. What a blessing. I'm so glad I was not the homecoming speaker. This is who God wanted to be here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Thank you all for allowing Tilly and me, our family, to serve you in this place. We, uh, we are humbled. We love you and thank God for his faithfulness. 
And uh, after the service, I'm going to invite Dr. and Mrs. Smith to join me in the foyer. Come by and show your love. And then we have a luncheon downstairs. I hope you will come and join us as we have a great meal downstairs. But Bill, I think, has a word at this time. Thank you for hanging on just a few more minutes. We do have a lunch downstairs afterwards, and we do hope you'll come and join. But I want to draw your attention to the screens for just a few minutes. came and he said Todd I want to tell you a story and he pulled out of his overcoat a fork and he placed it on the table beside me he said Todd years ago there was a little old lady that everybody called Aunt Abby she was at church every time the doors were open she was a faithful woman of God and one day Aunt Abby went up to her pastor and she said preacher when I die I want to be buried with my Bible in one hand and my fork in the other. He said, well, Aunt Evie, I know why you want to be buried with your Bible. You're a godly Christian woman. But why in the world do you want to be buried with your fork? She said, preacher, you know how we have all these meetings and eatings on the church grounds? She said, every time the sweet ladies come to take my plate, they'll say, now, Aunt Abby, you save your fork, you keep your fork, because the best is yet to come. eternity for those who know Christ and for those who are going through a difficult time in your life the best is still yet to come commit the best is yet to come lift it high in the air as we pray a prayer of commitment oh god we lift these forks in our hands symbolically 
because our faith and our trust is in Christ and in Christ alone. And we believe your hand has been upon us for 225 years, and we still believe the best is yet to come in the life of this church and in our lives. And I pray, oh God, as we make this commitment, that others might commit their life to Christ, and others might come to rekindle their vows to you or join this family of faith. We love you. We trust you. We follow you wherever you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. The best is still yet to come. great to have these years with the real deal. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. You join as we sing and continue to shine. Jesus, shine. You sing with us. prays, let me remind you that today, between the hours of four and six, you'll have the opportunity to come to the fellowship hall and share in a special time of saying thank you to Todd and his family. We hope you'll join us. Drop in between four and six. Thank you.